Mr. President, ladies and gentlemen, what I want to talk to you about today is what I call a view from the sea. That is to say, the science that I've been working on in the Arctic and indeed the Antarctic on the marine geophysical signature of past ice sheets. But before I start, what I'd like to do is, first of all, to thank the IASC for the award of their 2014 medal. It's a great privilege for me to receive this medal, and I appreciate it and shall cherish it very much indeed. Thank you to IASC for that. Secondly, I'd like to thank the rector and staff at the Catholic University of Valparaiso in Chile, uh, where I'm presently on sabbatical. They have kindly allowed the recording uh, that you're seeing now to take place. Many people have been important in my academic career. As an undergraduate, taking lectures from David Drury and the late Gordon Robin in the Scott Polar Research Institute and Department of Geography in Cambridge first stimulated me to be interested in the Arctic and the Antarctic. They, David, then supervised my doctoral thesis in glacier geophysics. I had the great good fortune also to do a master's degree in the University of Colorado in INSTAR under the supervision of John Andrews. That too was a very valuable experience and I gained my first field work in Baffin Island at that time. School is a very important part of all our lives and has been. My teachers at school and university I would like to thank very much John Barrett and Nigel Bates at Magdalen College School in Oxford and Robin Donkin, my mentor and director of studies at Jesus College in Cambridge. Colleagues in Cambridge, in Bristol and Aberystwyth where I've also worked and around the world, both faculty, postdocs and of course research students who are most important uh, have all worked with me and indeed helped me on many occasions and I'm very grateful for their collaboration over many years in the polar regions. And finally, of course, I'd like to thank my family for supporting me throughout. My wife, Evelyn, who is also a scientist in her own right, our children, Vicky and Adam, and my parents, all of them for putting up with my long absences in the Arctic. Many of you will understand that very well. So, what is the science problem that I want to address? Firstly, it's that modern ice sheet beds are often buried under several kilometers of ice. That means they're inaccessible, it's difficult to see what is going on. The use of the glacial marine record allows us relatively ease of access to shelf seas using ships, relatively ease of geophysical work through water. The submarine landforms that we view using these geophysical tools are often unmodified since deposition. Sedimentation rates are also very low in many of these areas during interglacials, and this informs us about both the distribution and the flow of ice. The tools that we use are from ships for the most part, swath bathymetry, that's multi-beam echo sounding to describe submarine landforms, two and three-dimensional seismic methods to look at the stratigraphy of those features, and core sedimentology and geotechnical properties to understand more about the details of the sediments themselves. What I want to talk about then is firstly the reconstruction of past ice sheet form and flow. Secondly, what we can learn about basal processes from looking at the marine record. Thirdly, about ice sheet retreat and how we can use information on that to test numerical models. And finally, a more detailed example, the case of surge type glaciers. So firstly then, reconstructing ice sheet form and flow. The sort of detail that we can obtain using swath bathymetric data sets is shown in this image and the next one. We can see clearly stratified bed forms and also grounding zone wedges in this part of the North Norwegian shelf. Indeed, a very spectacular seafloor which stretches about almost 200 kilometers in this particular image. If we turn to East Greenland, right from the glaciers such as Rink Ispray in West Greenland to the continental shelf, we can image the seafloor and we can see streamlined glacial landforms indicative of past ice extent and indeed fast flow, in this case, in the Umanak trough. And we must remember not only that these landforms um, are observed in the quaternary record on high latitude margins, but also recent observations beneath Antarctic ice streams have shown these sort of features actually forming 
in real time. They are certainly therefore the manifestation of fast flow of former ice streams. So, in terms of reconstruction, what can we do? Well, the simplest thing is we can simply ask questions such as how far did the Greenland ice sheet extend across continental shelves during full glacials? The traditional view that you have here is not very far in the northeast of Greenland. We have been to northeast Greenland with the James Clark Ross and we see on the extensive northeast Greenland shelf, which is about 200, 250 kilometers wide, in the northeast, where previous reconstructions have suggested that ice had not gone out this far, we find streamlined subglacial landforms which indicate clearly that ice has actually extended beyond the outer coast of Greenland at least 150 to 200 kilometers across that continental shelf. And that means we've simply got to rethink the paleoglaciology of that part of the ice sheet. They're arguably is more precipitation than would have been necessary in order to keep the ice within the outer coast. So the marine geology and geophysics feeds into our understanding clearly of the paleoglaciology. Taking the wider context of the two and a half thousand kilometer Norwegian Svalbard margin from the Skagerrak right up to north of Svalbard, we can also, from a series of cruises and data sets, some of them from industry, from a number of academics in different universities, we can map out the features that you've seen in the previous diagrams. And that allows us to reconstruct on the left the positions of former ice streams on that whole two and a half thousand kilometer long margin uh, at the last glacial maximum. And you can see those indicated there in gray with slower flowing light gray uh, ice in between. And we can then use the positions of those ice streams and to ask the question, can ice sheet numerical models of the last full glacial and the last deglacial actually reconstruct the position of those ice streams or not. And so this is a simple but robust test of those ice sheet models. We can also look deeper into the geological record using recently acquired, mostly by industry, recently acquired 3D seismic cubes. And those allow us to look at buried surfaces, sometimes buried hundreds of meters below the present seafloor. Those are former uh, former continental shelves, and we can see on them again examples of streamlining where up to two and a half million years ago, in the case of the Norwegian margin, ice was actually flowing across the Norwegian shelf and producing similar landforms in stratigraphies like the one that you see here. And the deepest part of the Quaternary glacial record here is over a thousand meters in thickness and aged about 2.7 million years ago. We can go even further back in the late Ordovician glacial rocks of Northern Africa, because of course, uh, Africa was in a polar position at this time in the past. We can see similar landforms both in outcrop and in 3D seismic records. So we can extend right the way through geological time the knowledge that we gain on modern high latitude continental shelves. So I've talked about ice streams so far, but what about the areas between the ice streams, the inter ice stream areas? You can see here for Svalbard, a number of fast flowing ice streams indicated by the closely spaced lines. In between them, with much smaller catchments, are inter ice stream areas. Those are fed by basins an order of magnitude less large than the fast flowing ice streams. And here we see a different set of landforms. We see landforms that are mostly produced transverse to flow, terminal moraines, recessional moraines, retreat moraines. There is some evidence in the images you see here of parallel to ice flow streamlining, but most of the features are actually transverse to flow. And that is because ice is grounded and it's flowing more slowly in these inter-ice stream areas. And we can put that to together in two landform assemblage models. The first um, for inter-ice stream areas where there are predominantly transverse to flow features in the geological record. Secondly, ice streams themselves when the predominant features are streamlined subglacial landforms produced parallel to ice flow. And those are two important differences in what we look for in the record. Secondly, can submarine landforms tell us anything about basal processes, including the hydrology of ice sheets at a large scale? 
I'm switching to Antarctica now. One of the things I have found valuable, although <clears throat> I think probably two-thirds of my work has been in the Arctic, it has been useful to see the other side of the coin, as it were, to see Antarctic ice in action too. So this is an example of the 300-kilometre-long Marguerite Trough across the continental shelf in the Antarctic Peninsula. In the inner shelf, closer to the present glaciers, we see predominantly a submarine landscape of bedrock drumlins and ice-moulded bedrock. And indeed, there are a series of meltwater channels which you can see on the right in particular, um, which show former subglacial flow. And if one looks in detail at those channels, you can see that they've got the up and down profile, which is characteristic of subglacial water flow. On the middle shelf, there is a transition between that bedrock-dominated landscape to a submarine landscape that is transitioning towards a sedimentary bed. There are still some meltwater channels, but you can see now some streamlined sedimentary features too. And by the time we get to the outer shelf, and you can see the shelf edge in the image um, uh, uh, on, on, on the left here, um, there we can see megascale glacial lineation, streamlined features. There, interestingly, is no sign at all of channelized subglacial water. If water is moving, it's moving within the sediments by Darcian processes. So meltwater features are absent on the outer shelf.